welcome to a Podstemology. Epistemology. You know what I like a lot more than materialistic things? Knowledge. What is this? It's a podcast. Hello, hello, hello. Thanks for joining me for another episode of a Podstemology where we splice galaxy brain takes with popular culture outtakes. Today we're talking about the future of taxation. My guest is Dr. Robert Brunig from the Australian National University. Brunig is not a real doctor, but he is a real Bob. He's also professor and director of the Tax and Transfer Policy Institute at the Crawford School of Public Policy. Bob joins me to explain what optimal taxation is all about, how taxation has changed over the last 50 years or so, and what solutions exist to pressing taxation problems like base shifting multinationals and the super rich. Now, I bet you're thinking, Damn, I wish this event were tonight. And you're in luck because it's right now. A podstemology. Welcome to the podcast, Bob. How are you? Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me on. I'm all right. How are you doing? Great. Yeah, I'm doing all right here in uh, in London. It's recently gotten strangely cold again, but whatever. Um, so we're here to talk about tax. So I thought we could start with some very general questions like why do we do taxation? So I'm just thinking about mon- monetary theory, which is very popular at the moment, and how we don't tax to fund public services um, according to modern monetary theory. So what's your take on why we do taxation? Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to, I won't swing at the modern monetary theory, but I guess if you sort of think about what, you know, what the, what are the really two big roles of government uh, that uh, we need to fund with taxation? One of them is the provision of public services. So I think that is a reason that we tax. So government does things, it, it, it builds bridges, it provides education, it provides healthcare, uh, and we need to get money to do those things, and, and tax is certainly one way to get it. The other thing government does, and, and at least in countries like Australia and most of Western Europe, this is actually the bigger function of government, is uh, moving money around. So taking money from some people who have a lot of it and giving money to other people who have less of it. And the best way to do that is, is through the tax and transfer system. So whenever I think about tax, I think about transfer at the same time. I try not mm-hmm. to separate those two things in my mind. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about kind of what what you want to do with tax and what you want to do with transfers because they're there. And I think thinking about that is a useful thing to think about. But but um, you know, before going there, why do we why do we do that? It's it's for two reasons. One is that um, we've created a lot of wealth uh, through economic activity, and the way that we create that uh, is mostly through using uh, markets, and markets don't always produce equal outcomes. So we like the growth and the innovation and the wealth creation that markets bring, but we don't always like the way the outcomes fall. And and one way to deal with that is is rather than try to stifle that growth and innovation is to let it happen, but then tax people and transfer to those who have less. So that's kind of one rationale. The other rationale is is really just about insurance. Um, So you you can't buy an insurance policy before you're born that protects you from being born into a poor family. And society says, we're going to provide a minimum level of services and income to you, irrespective of what life events might happen to you. And we do that through our health and education provision, but we also do it through cash transfers. And one of the reasons that you see different countries kind of choosing different amounts of that, I think, is just that different people have different preferences. And then in democracies, hopefully those preferences kind of bubble up to the top and the amount of redistribution we see in countries probably reflects some underlying level of how much of that people want. Okay, yeah, sweet. I want to pick up on a lot of things in there. So um, so can you talk a little bit more about um, how you'd think about the kind of comparative advantages of taxes and transfers or like how do you separate the, the uses of those in public policy in your thinking? Yeah, I, I, that's actually, I think, a, a point where people get muddled a lot. Um, I think you really want to think about tax in terms of economic efficiency. Mm -hmm. So um, taxes have costs. I should back up. So there are some taxes that don't have any costs. There are some taxes that have revenue and have social benefits. So for example, if I put a tax on pollution, Mm -hmm. I reduce the amount of pollution, which improves well-being, but I also get tax revenue. But that's, those kind of taxes are, you know, a tiny fraction of our taxes. Mm -hmm. Most of our taxes have costs. So I put a tax on labor income. I put a tax on your working. What does that do? It makes leisure cheaper relative to work. We think people work less and consume more leisure. I put a tax on corporations. Corporations might engage in a lot of activity to try to then shift uh, 
uh, profits to another country uh, to avoid paying tax. This is not productive activity for society. It's only productive for the company. Um, so any tax is going to impose these kind of costs where people are going to take action to try to avoid paying the tax. And, and those things produce costs in both of kind of distortions of economic activity, if you will, but also in terms of growth and, and innovation and the kind of things we want the economy to do. So mm -hmm. when we think about tax, we really want to think about what is the stuff we could tax that's going to have the lowest economic cost. And so I really like to think about tax in terms of efficiency. It turns out that the taxing the things that have the lowest economic cost usually means taxing things like land or consumption. A land tax tends to be pretty progressive because the most expensive land is usually held by the richest people. Consumption taxation is neutral or perhaps slightly regressive. So then you want to think about using your transfer system to offset that. Transfers, you really want to think about trying to fix up things in society that you think are problematic either from an inequality point of view or from the point of view of having certain activities that we view as more desirable than others. Um, and then you might want to uh, transfer money to people who are undertaking those activities. So for example, you know, you might want to give grants to not-for-profit organizations to, to do the things that they do. The, the problem is that we often use the tax system to achieve other social objectives. So for example, you know, suppose I say, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great thing that people adopt uh, old greyhound dogs that used to be used for track racing. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now give people a tax deduction if they adopt a greyhound dog. Um, and what, what you're going to get then is you're going to get people who shouldn't be adopting dogs adopting a dog just to get a, a, a tax deduction. And you're gonna get people adopting different kinds of dogs and claiming that they're greyhounds and getting a tax deduction. You're gonna create a whole set of activity that's not making anybody any better off. Um, if you're interested in supporting adoption of greyhound dogs, then you're better off directly uh, giving some kind of support to transferring money to people who are doing that and, and, mm -hmm. and letting, them, letting them do that. So we often use our tax system to try to achieve social objectives that would that end up creating a lot of inefficiency, but that would be much better, we'd be much better off doing it through the transfer system. So I think yeah. about you know tax efficiency, transfer equity. And if you want, you know, one kind of uh, you know, one line bullet point. That's how I would think about it. Yeah. And then I think on your on your point about using the tax system to pr promote equity, I think another thing that we do is we don't reform the tax system in a very efficiency enhancing direction because we are concerned about equity. So I often say that um, this argument that we can't raise consumption taxes, like goods and services taxes and this kind of thing, because it's regressive, um, is like the left wing version of right wing climate denialism. It's like this this reform that pretty much everyone who works in tax just froths consumption taxes. They think it's great, it should be 20% or whatever at a minimum, good stuff. Um, and then like, as soon as it hits the politics, there's just no appetite for it. Um, and and left-wing parties in particular always make a lot of hay out of um, this idea that it's, it's regressive in the same way that um, right-wing parties will often make hay out of this idea that taxing carbon or, or any other sort of pollution is like bad for the economy when you know united economists will say that actually it's good for the economy because pollution is bad for the economy exactly yeah. and and yeah. there's so there's a good example of of how to do this which is in australia when when australia did introduce a carbon tax which mm. subsequently got repealed the carbon tax was actually introduced alongside a transfer compensation mm. package which increased the amount of payments that people who were on fixed incomes and depend upon the government got mm. and it was explicitly offsetting the extra money that they were going to have to pay for the carbon tax yeah. primarily on their utility bills and interestingly enough when the carbon tax was repealed they didn't repeal the compensation for the carbon tax so so but that's how you want to think about it you want to do both of those things hmm. um the other thing before talking to you mark i sort of was, was thinking about like myths of taxation so here's oh, yeah. here's here's myth number 1 myth number 1 is that is it the nordic countries <laughs> <laughs> finance their their social security systems through taxing the rich really heavily and, yeah. and then redistributing to the poor. And that's actually not true. The, the taxes are all paid by people in the middle, right? Consumption yeah. taxes are very, very high. And payroll taxes uh, in the form of social security contributions are very, very high. Yeah. So 
so the way that the Nordic countries do their redistribution is they kind of tax everybody. Yeah. They give money back. They give more money to the bottom than they take away from them. Mm -hmm. They give a little bit less money to the middle than they take away from them because they lose some of it in administering it. And they give a lot less money to the rich than what they take mm -hmm. away from them. But, they're, but they really are taxing very heavily in the middle. Yeah. Which makes a lot of sense politically. I mean, I've often thought that this isn't quite thought through by people who just want to like crush corporations or crush rich people is that if you have corporations paying enormous amounts of taxation, then they feel entitled to tell the government what to do because they're funding it. Whereas if you have a much broader tax base where the citizenry is actually in the income tax is the main way that, that people fund the government, then citizens feel like the government works for them because they pay the bills. Um, yeah, at least that's something I've, I've kind of always thought was was embedded in, in the Nordic model. But I would need to, I mean, I did date a Norwegian for a long time, um, but based on that end of one, that's kind of my conclusion. <laughs> but your, your comments uh, lead me into the next uh, thing that I wanted to pick up from your opening um, remarks, which is that, there, as I understand it, there are differences in how certain countries approach um, the use of the transfer system in particular. Um, but the taxes and transfers combined to manage redistribution and equity. So we often hear about pre and post tax Gini coefficients. So mm. the Gini coefficients are a measure of equity. Um, and then pre tax, it's often very high. Um, and then post tax and transfer, there can be quite radical changes. So the Australian as Gini coefficient, as I understand it, really shifts quite a lot pre and post tax and transfer because we have really quite liberal market settings, which means that there's quite a lot of inequality, as you said, but then we, we redistribute that. But the Australian approach is um, to use a lot of targeting. So we, we tax people that are capable of paying taxes and we transfer only to people who need transfers. Whereas as I understand it, the French system, for example, is, is very different. It's, it relies much more on clawbacks where you transfer to a lot of people, um, but then you also tax the benefits that you're giving to middle-class households. Um, so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how kind of different countries use different sort of stratagems in this way to achieve and outcomes and what the differences are in those outcomes. Yeah, I think uh, this is the kind of, I guess, quintessential divide between what you might think of as a universal welfare state like, mm -hmm. like France or, or, or the Scandinavian countries and a residual welfare state, which is much a much better description of the US or Australia. And, and I guess, so a couple of things. One is that, you know, again, the political economy of this is sort of interesting, right? So people in, in, France and the Nordic countries will argue that the universality is really important in the welfare system because then you get really wide buy-in from voters for that system. Mm -hmm. And um, because everybody's benefiting from it. So everybody has a, has a stake in, in keeping it going. The downside, of course, is that it's very expensive. So if you look at the tax take to GDP in those countries, it can be up to 45%, whereas in a country like Australia, the tax take to GDP is about 28%. Wow, so funny. what you end up with is if you're in the middle, the government's taking a lot of your money and then it's giving it back to you, sometimes in the form of money, but often in the form of particular kinds of services. Mm -hmm. Now you might think that the services the government's getting you, giving you are maybe not what you would have bought with your own money. So there's, so I'm kind of as an economist, you know, of the view that people are, are in a position to decide what's going to give them the most well-being mm -hmm. out of spending their own money. So my, my, my tendency is very much to favor the, the residual system. The, the problem of the residual system in Australia, and, it, and this is somewhat in the media at the moment, actually, is that because we target very heavily, it means that as people start to make money, we take benefits away from them. Now, what this does is it creates very large work disincentives for certain elements of the population. And we see this right now at the moment, you know, very strongly with the discussion around how should we subsidize childcare in Australia. So we subsidize childcare well. in the U.S. as well. That's right. So we don't have universal childcare subsidies like they do in France. Instead, we have targeted. Uh, we treat childcare as kind of a welfare program. Maybe, maybe you want to move it out of the welfare program and move it into education. And then I think we'd think about it differently. But given how we think about it, middle-class families with two earners, husband working full-time, wife working part-time, if she wants to start working a fourth day or a fifth day, she's often going to lose 80 or 90 cents of every additional dollar she makes with the combined cost of reduction in childcare benefits, reduction in family tax payments, plus 
additional income tax that gets paid. So you know, Australia has pretty good female labor force participation in terms of looking at who's in the labor market and who isn't, but we have this very, very high uh, part-time uh, work uh, for women in Australia. So I think the highest in the OECD. And one does have to wonder to what degree, I, this is a puzzle. Okay, so there's some things I just don't think I know the answer to, but yeah. you, you could look at it and say, wow, that's probably a function of how we means test childcare subsidies and how mm -hmm. we means test family payments. But actually, if you look in the data um, and you ask people, why are you working part-time instead of full-time? Very few people say it's because of childcare costs. Mm -hmm. Most people would say it's because I want to work part-time. Yeah. So do Australians just have different preferences than other countries? Uh, have those preferences kind of grown organically from yeah. our tax and transfer system and they would change if we change that? So, you know, I guess that's the, I, I've gone down a childcare path here, but, but to get back to your original question, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think this idea of whether you want something that's universal or something that's residual is is really a key thing. And, and neither of them are perfect, is, is all yeah. I would say. So, so I think those are the two big trade-offs. On the one hand, there's this, you know, the kind of efficiency loss of the government taking your money and then giving it back to you. Um, in the residual approach, uh, you're going to pay a lot less tax, which means you're going to have more agency over your own money, but but you, you risk uh, disincentivizing uh, certain groups in the population in terms of working. And that, Lauren, is how taxes work. But that's not fair. You're learning. Uh-oh. Capital gains tax. Let's go back to childcare and work incentives for a bit. Because I, I did follow the um, the discussion in the U.S. a bit around uh, Mitt Romney's childcare plan. Um, and there was a lot of talk in the U.S. there about whether or not this is going to have work effects. Um, and I've always found that discussion, particularly in the US, to just be a little bit um, impoverished. Um, so in particular, that there's not much of a discussion about the intensive versus the extensive margin. So there's always this, uh, this sense that everything's going to be at the extensive margin. So people are just going to go from working to not working, um, when actually the change is, I think, more likely to be on the intensive margin. So people are just going to reduce their hours slightly. And then there's another question about you know, is that a bad thing? Um, and I think there's not much kind of sensitivity to who the marginal worker is and how that changes across countries. So the US economic debates always inform debates in other countries. It's kind of inevitable that um, the US just has this cultural power, which is quite unfortunate because having lived in the US recently, I think it's a very unusual place and people don't realize how unusual it is. But anyway, so I'm, I'm often thinking with like um, childcare, for example, that one reason why you want mothers, for example, working, particularly single mothers, is because you want them to do good role modeling for the kids that you can't um, mm. just subsist on benefits or whatever. But at the same time, it, I always felt like you could get that role modeling with just 25 hours a week. Uh, and then with some childcare subsidies, the mother is around to parent more and pass on these other benefits to the kids. Um, whereas if, if they're having to work 50 hours a week on the minimum wage to claim the earned income tax credit, because that's the way you do welfare payments, then you just end up in this situation where, yeah, you've got the mothers working, but they're not parenting, which is its own problem. Do you have any reactions to that? So one of the things that we learned back in the, in the mid nineties from the welfare to work reforms in the state of Wisconsin, mm -hmm. um, so, so Clinton, uh, wanted to to reduce the number of people on the welfare rolls and in particular was very focused on single parents and, mm -hmm. and but he gave states a lot of freedom in what to do and so what the state of wisconsin did was it actually spent just as much money as it was spending before on welfare but it instead gave it in kind so it gave it in terms of child care subsidies um and and my impression from that is that for the most part that the the evaluations of that suggest that that was good for the average kid so the average kid got better quality care by being in a licensed daycare than they were getting at home. Mm -hmm. And they got this benefit of the moms working and the role modeling, right? So, so, so I guess you're, so, so I would say there is evidence both for the value of care and, and the value of that, having a role model of a parent who works. Um, the, and, and of course there's heterogeneity in the effects. I mean, there's some yeah. people who, who didn't do well. And if you think about a distribution of single moms from those who are kind of the least work ready to those who are the most work ready, it was those who were work ready who, who did well and who really mm -hmm. benefited from this. 
the right balance between working hours and childcare, I guess, is and and parental care, I, I think, is something we know less about. I, I just don't know what the data would say is kind of the right balance. But again, my sense is that you know, when I think about how we want to construct childcare, how we want to construct family payments, how we want to construct parental leave, I think it's about creating opportunities and options for families. And again, I guess I, you know, kind of default to thinking families probably know what's best for their mm. kid. Parents know what's best for their kids in terms of the amount of time they should be in daycare and the amount of time they shouldn't be in daycare. And and so I want to give them some flexibility and some options around around combining that in the way that's that's best for them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, but I certainly you know just and you know you've you dated a Norwegian and I'm married to a childcare uh, center director, yeah. so we can draw on our sample size of size one. I, yeah, I would suggest that the kids who are in care from eight in the morning until six p.m. Mm -hmm. uh, at my wife's center, um, not because they're children of single moms working minimum wage, but rather because they're mm -hmm. children of high powered, uh, dual income yeah. uh, couples, uh, probably, uh, suffer from being in care that long rather mm -hmm. than being with their family. So, so there, it strikes me that your, your, your kind of hypothesis, that there's some optimal amount, uh, that's mm -hmm. less than 50, I, I think is, is probably <laughs> correct. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting what you mentioned about um, in-kind payments and stuff because I, so when I was following that debate, I was looking at um, like the Democrat plan, crudely speaking, was mostly about subsidising childcare and the Romney plan, as I understand it, was more about subsidising kids in a sense, saying like, here's money and you spend it how you think would benefit your family the most. Um, and uh, there was some interesting data brought out by Brad Wilcox, I think his name is at AEI, just saying that most Americans' preference seem to be for um, familism, I think he called it, um, whereas the Democrat program was really aimed at workism and it was aimed at kind of like freeing mothers in particular to go back to work, which is, you know, a noble ambition or whatever. But he was saying that a lot of people actually just wanted to spend more time with their kids and work less. Um, and, mm -hmm. and that it was interesting that there wasn't really a, a policy proposal that was pitched directly at the preferences of the public. Well, I suspect a lot of the part-time work in Australia is exactly driven by that. Um, mm -hmm. People who who want to afford a certain lifestyle, so living on one income is not enough, mm -hmm. uh, but they don't want to be working uh, combined hours as a couple of 100 or 90 hours a week. Mm -hmm. um, and so having part-time work where then uh, people can have a bit of flexibility, uh, to have a day a week where they do other things or spend some time with their kids, maybe only send their kids to childcare three or four days a week instead of five. Yeah. I think a lot of this has to do with preferences. I, I don't think it's just about the tax and transfer yeah. system. You know, the fact that what we see is that's almost 99% women who are doing that yeah. and, and, and taking care of that flexibility probably reflects the rather traditional gender division that Australia yeah. exhibits. It's never too early to learn that the government is a greedy piglet that suckles on a taxpayer's teat until they have sore, chapped nipples. Okay, cool. So let's get back to public services then. So we've kind of talked a lot about taxes and transfers, redistribution, disincentive effects, all that. So the other half of the kind of what we use tax for is, is providing public services. Do you think that, so here we're kind of talking about government needing revenue to spend on these services. Um, so what are some of the things uh, within public services? And I think you've already mentioned a lot of the obvious ones, transport, health, education, that sort of thing. But maybe one slightly more interesting question might be, well, how have, has this bundle of things changed over the last 50 years or so? Are there things that government spends money on now that it, it didn't in the past or that are super expensive or not expensive or yeah, I'm, well, the answer to that is pretty much everything. It's it, it, it's what's interesting is you don't have to go very far back in history to find a time where government pretty much didn't do anything. Um, mm. You know, the, the tax to GDP ratio before World War One in most countries was less than five yeah. percent, right? And yeah. and today the OECD average is like thirty three or thirty five, right? So, so so you know, both world wars led to this huge ramp up in in government provision of services, um, and. And in many ways, it was, was driven by, originally driven by 
older, the, the kind of beginning of the welfare state, I think very much was driven by older people who found themselves in, 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 in dire financial stress during the Great mm-hmm. Depression. At least in the US, that's where kind of the first transfer payments, right? So here are these old people who've, you know, worked all their life. They're, um, they're worthy poor as opposed to unworthy poor, which in the US is obviously very important. Um, and they're homeless and they're starving. And boy, we need some kind of pension system to pay for these people, right? And then we've mm-hmm. gradually extended the, those systems to, to, to other people. And then we've gotten in the business of, of, I guess, insurance, which is, you know, after World War II, the government became a big insurer. And, and, and so you can think about uh, the amount of money government spend in healthcare uh, as mm-hmm. primarily being about, about health insurance. Um, and, and, and now, you know, some of the big things that we're looking at in the Western world are, are going to be, how are we going to fund aged care? Yeah. So, so we've had this evolution that's, I guess, followed in many ways, demographics. Um, and now the big question is, uh, what kinds of aged care are we going to deliver to people? How are we going to fund that? How are we going to make sure that it's equitably distributed? How are we mm-hmm. going to regulate it? Obviously, in Australia, it's been a big, uh, a big problem. Um, so I think I think that insurance role of government is the one that I see as really, really kind of ballooned since the 1980s, and and even in in other areas, uh, responding to bushfires, responding to floods, mm-hmm. you know, the government ends up spending millions of dollars insuring people in in a way that you know would have been unthinkable even probably 70 or 80 years ago. It's not what we would have done. It would have just been like, well, you know, it's an act of God. Your house got flooded. You know, deal with it. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, so, so that's, and I think there's an expectation now that, at least in Australia, there's a strong expectation that government kind of is there to bail you out if something goes wrong, um, and and that's, you know, that's potentially uh, kind of dangerous for your uh-huh. society at some point, right? I mean, you you want people to, to 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 take personal responsibility, and you also want people, I guess, to accept that. Um, you know, that, that life comes with risks and that there are trade-offs. Uh, mm-hmm. So, but, but we do have this kind of, you know, government is the insurer of last resort for every potential problem. Uh, yeah, I think one of the, the interesting tricky cases there is like, so we had these big floods in Sydney recently, um, right on my dad's kind of doorstep. He was, I don't know, 15 blocks from it or something. <laughs> um, and and uh, he was saying that it was all farcical because it's a well-known floodplain. Um, and so, right. of course, it flooded. <laughs> um, and he's like, you know, the real problem is that the government should never have released that land for development, um, right. but that there's corruption there. And then if they release the land for development, then then they are kind of on the hook to um, cover the insurance. And a lot of these, and, you know, I was flip-flopping on this a lot because my, my partner was kind of saying, oh, there's all these people in this news complaining about how they like, oh, the insurance companies have really let them down because the premiums were too high. And she's like, the premiums are too high because you shouldn't have built there because it's a floodplain. Um, and yeah, but then the government shouldn't have released the land, but then personal responsibility you should have done a due diligence and realize that you can't build there because it's a floodplain. Same sort of thing with bushfire prone land. So I don't know where to, where to think about um, responsibility there. There is a tax story on those high premiums too, which is that when the GST came in, states were supposed to get rid of stamp duty on insurance. And mm-hmm. at least in New South Wales, they didn't do that. So right. insurance right. policies still have this very high stamp duty on them. And that's one of the most distortionary taxes in terms of people's responses. So if you mm-hmm. got rid of stamp duty on insurance, you would actually get more people buying insurance. Um, right. Not of course, not everybody doesn't buy insurance for that reason, but at the margin, I think there would be an improvement. Um, but yeah, we saw the same thing with the Queensland floods ten years ago. It was was that that you know local councils made a lot of money by letting by releasing land that we know floods regularly. Um, wow. So the, yeah, I was reading an article in the AFR that the those flood basins in in Sydney that that where it flooded, we can expect once every 20 years yeah, for there to be a flood of this magnitude. Yeah. So, so and, and, and it is true that often in the media, you get this kind of, oh my God, this is an unprecedented event that has never happened before. And, and it's like, actually, no, if you go back through the records to 1800, it happens about every 20 years, right? Yeah. Um, and and so, so you're right, either we need to, to some, something there needs fixing. And I agree with you, I have a hard time kind of kind of you know assessing blame right do you do you release the land but make people sign a waiver mm. uh you know do you uh do you not release the land and do you say to people we're gonna 
you know, not bail you out if you don't have private insurance um, mm -hmm. and then actually follow through on it. It's very hard when, when bad things happen to people and there are sad stories yeah. in the news for government not to do something. So, so I think it is a tricky, uh, it, it is one of those tricky things. Yeah. The internet didn't get invented on its own. Government research created the internet so that all the companies could make money off the internet. The point is, is that when we succeed, we succeed because of our individual initiative, but also because we do things together. There's some things just like fighting fires we don't do on our own. Let's spend a little bit more time talking about this notion of insurer of last resort, because I think that's something that's not particularly well understood. So um, maybe two things that um, I think are good examples of that in action. So the simple one is just healthcare. So correct me if I'm wrong in my analysis, but so if you have adverse selection, which is where I as an insurer don't know whether these three 50 year old people that I've got in front of me have an equal risk of, of contracting an illness. Like maybe actually one of them is secretly knows that they have like a congenital issue or something and they're just not telling me. Right. Um, now, because I do know that overall, I'm going to have to pay out a certain amount of money. I can figure out the probability of my payout. I'll just charge all three of them the same high premium. Whereas ideally I would want to be able to target the person who has a really um, high likelihood, charge them a higher premium, and then I can offer a lower premium to the other two people. And the kind of way that single payer insurance works, and we don't have sort of single payer anywhere, but having the government step in as a very large supplier of healthcare has, has basically the same effect is that the government overall looks at the expenditure on healthcare. And then on the basis of that, kind of charges the same levy out to everybody. Um, and that way the government can actually minimize the sort of, well, can actually can deliver that insurance in an efficient fashion, whereas a private market actually can't do that. <clears throat> um, and then you also get monopsony and all this kind of stuff. Is that, does that basically sound right? Yeah, so what happens in that adverse selection case is the insurance company charges that kind of average premium mm. and then the low risk people don't buy yeah. and then the insurance company is left with all the high risk people um once it works that out then it raises the premium to yeah. you know and, and then you end up with a with a pool of people who won't be insured mm. uh combined with uh, very high premiums that only attract those who really are going to need it yeah exactly yeah right so um, yeah i'm just kind of interested in these cases where by you know taxing and through taxing facilitating the delivery of services on a grand scale by government you can often capture efficiencies that you wouldn't otherwise be able to capture and i guess the other one that's that's really interesting for me is, is student loans um which is mm. another case of adverse selection so there are some people who, who if you give them a loan then they are going to graduate and they are going to pay it back um, and then there's also some people who are at risk of not graduating and they're not going to pay it back so if i'm a private bank or a private lender then those people on the margin, they're very risky to me. So maybe I just won't give a loan to any of them. Whereas if I'm the government, I can give a loan to everyone and either just cop it, like take the loss for equity reasons. Um, but I think what's really powerful about government loans in a very simple fashion, we don't need to worry about like income contingent loans or anything like that. It's just that um, I can recoup a lot of my losses, not only through the repayments of the people that I give loans who do end up graduating and getting good jobs, but also through the extra tax they pay because now they're more educated. My letter will start off real nice in black ink. Dear Finesse, we noticed you are 60 days late on your student loan payment. Then it'll switch to the red bold ink. If you do not pay back your student loan, we'll make it so you'll never be able to buy a house. If you do not pay back your student loan, we'll make it so that you'll never be able to buy a car. We'll ruin your credit. You'll never get financed. We'll have you deported. You'll never be an American citizen. I'm like, what? How much power does Citibank have? <laughs> Do you have any reactions to that? And also are there other things that you've come across that are, are kind of big scale risk management, things like that, that are cool and nifty? I mean, I think of the entire kind of transfer system as being that big scale insurance program as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, but, but maybe that's more of a social insurance than an economic efficiency argument. Uh, I guess in education as well, you, you, I think there are those same kind of uh, efficiency arguments that if, if your system were entirely private, you'd probably end up undereducating your population. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and in particular, the, the people at the bottom would be the ones who wouldn't get the education. And, and that would, that's bad both for equality, but also for democracy and, mm -hmm. and the functioning of your, of your system. So 
So there too, I think there are efficiency gains. In healthcare, you know, the other advantage the government have has is it can it can have some market power on the buying side, right? So that when you actually buy pharmaceuticals or you contract for services, you can actually, since you're you're negotiating on behalf of millions of people, you can actually strike a pretty good deal. Um, and and you know, pharmaceutical companies are pretty powerful and the industry is pretty concentrated. And so having some market power on the other side mm. uh, that, that can fight against that, I think is, is, is important. Um, and, you know, the, the evidence that those, uh, you know, single payer, uh, as you said, they're quasi single payer, but the, the single payer national healthcare systems really do seem to deliver much better outcomes per dollar yeah. than the systems that are entirely private. I mean, the evidence for that's really strong and pretty unambiguous. So um, I think this is one of those areas where it's it's good not to be too ideological uh, and yeah. to kind of look and say, where where is the market going to deliver the best outcome and where is government going to deliver the best outcome and how can I bring those two things together mm. um, rather than sort of, you know, being, oh, you know, market's bad or, you know, oh, government intervention bad, right? And and mm. and I think one of the, the U.S. is very, I agree that you said before the U.S. is weird in passing and and this is actually quite, quite true and it's amazing in Australia how many people hold beliefs mm. about aspects of government that are driven by what they've read about America. So, so, you know, young people in Australia, for example, uh, often say, uh, I don't think the age pension will be there when I retire or it won't be as generous because mm -hmm. the system's not sustainable. This is not true. Yeah. This is true in Western Europe. It's true in the US. It's simply not true in Australia. There's yeah. no evidence. If, in fact, if anything, the evidence is the opposite direction. The age pension's in incredibly good shape. And in fact, we're going to use it less and less because of superannuation. Um, another one is that the government spends lots of money on, on defense, which again in Australia is... You know, we spend about 6%. You might think that's a lot, but it's not, you know, people, if I ask young people, they often say oh, it's 15 or 20%. And again, they're getting some number from the US and yeah. then they're kind of applying it to Australia, right? And it's, mm -hmm. and and I do find that kind of dangerous <laughs> in terms yeah. of making local policy, right? And and also in the US, there are these, I mean, the, the strong ideological opposition to, 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 to public health care, mm -hmm. where where the really strong theoretical economic arguments are very much in favor of public health care yeah. is kind of odd, right? It, it, it's, mm -hmm. And it's, it's not driven, I think, by the, the economics right. It's driven by a, a, some yeah, kind of ideological, right. political, yeah. libertarian right. Yeah. Um, so just it's, it's interesting to try to bring those policies into place in, in frameworks where people are, have very strong ideological views. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So, all right, so we've got a sense for how government has expanded in particular in the post-World War II period, and so there's a lot more that government does now, uh, and the revenue requirements are different. So um, that's the revenue side. How has the situation facing tax collectors changed over the last 50 years? Um, what's kind of new there? Yeah, I guess, you know, the two big things, well, really one big thing, I think, that unites across everything is is the mobility of the factors of production uh -huh. um you know we used to have a factory in a country that produced a good that employed workers in that country that sold to consumers in that country and tax was pretty easy in that situation now we have global supply chains we have multinational firms with offices in lots of different countries and so capital has become much more mobile um it's much easier to, to move production from one site to another. And as we move into a world where a lot of the production that we're talking about is actually intellectual property and doesn't really have a physical manifestation, it's very easy to move that intellectual property and the production of that intellectual property from one country to another. So, you know, companies have exploited differences in tax rates across uh, different countries to organize their production in a way that minimizes their tax burden. Mm -hmm. How have countries responded to that? Um, countries have responded to that since the 1980s by lowering corporate tax rates. Sometimes that's described as a race to the bottom, which I actually don't think it is. I, I think it's a recognition of, of two things. One is that um, the because of the mobility of capital, if you tax capital, it can do one of two things. It can pay workers in the country less, or it can move to another country. So, so in many ways, the incidence of corporate tax falls on workers uh, yeah. in, in an open economy. 
And, and because countries want jobs and they want production in their country, they've lowered corporate tax rates. Um, I, I wouldn't call that a race to the bottom. Mm. Um, it's just a, it's just a recognition of who actually pays that corporate tax at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so it's annoying to, to think that corporation corporate tax falls on the capitalist class. Like, that's such an erroneous uh, piece of thinking. It's, like, it's, yeah, there you go. It's myth number two, right? Is that, mm-hmm. is that somehow taxing corporate that, that the way to the way to get the rich is to tax corporations? No, it's actually that's not true, right? The way to get the workers is to tax corporations, and people have a hard time kind of conceptualizing that, right? In in a perfect world, you wouldn't tax corporations at all, right? You would what you would do is you would just tax the people who get the profits from the corporations and you tax them through the personal income tax system. So corporations are just black boxes that are owned by people. They produce the goods that people buy. The best way to tax those things is to tax the consumption of the goods and then tax the incomes of the of, of both the workers and the people who, who produce the, who, who get the, the dividends, who own the company. Um, and, and in many ways, that's what we do in Australia. That's what our franking credit system does. It's just a withholding right. tax. And then, and then you, you set that off against whatever your tax liability is through the personal income tax system. And, and that recognizes that at the end of the day, there's different points in where I can capture the income and that capturing it at the corporate level probably doesn't make much sense because, mm-hmm. uh, that, that, because for the reasons I said, that, that will just move elsewhere and you'll lose all the revenue. The problem, you know, the reason we have a corporate tax is that if we lived in a world where corporations started on January 1st and then they all wound down at, on the 31st of December and all the money got distributed to the people who owned it, you just tax them then and it would all be fine. But the problem is that there's really two problems. One is that corporations can hold these profits, um, which allows them to shift them over time. Another thing is that people can take what looks, what, it, what should be classified as personal income and reclassify it as corporate income. And so if you had a zero corporate income tax, you'd get a lot of income reclassification. So that's why you want a non-zero but not too high sort of corporate tax. This mobility issue that's getting worse and worse in the corporate tax space Mm. is is actually happening in the personal income tax space too. And that's going to be one of the big challenges for tax collecting authorities going into the next 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. The workers are now much more mobile. And they're mobile in two senses. One is that I can subcontract someone to do work for me from Australia, and I can subcontract somebody in India, for example. So, mm-hmm. so the, the fact that I'm spending money on, on labor in Australia doesn't mean that the worker needs to be in Australia. Mm-hmm. And the second thing is there's just more and more movement of people around the world, um, more and more people with, with multiple citizenships, more and more people who might work in one country but on property in another country. And this, again, creates headaches for tax authorities and it creates opportunities for people to, in the same way that companies have opportunities to tax minimize through mm-hmm. international arbitrage, now individuals are going to have those opportunities, right? So what it means is that both our corporate tax system and our personal income tax system are not particularly resilient and sustainable going forward. And, you know, if you if you kind of look at at one level, if you kind of look at the aggregate amount of corporate and personal tax revenue in Australia, you would sort of say, oh, you know, things look okay, but they're not really going down over time. What, what's the problem with sustainability? But if you dig in a bit, hmm. what you see is that the, the people who are paying the tax are, are a smaller and smaller group of people. Right. So I think there's 11 companies in Australia that pay 50% of the corporate tax. Oh, wow. Yeah, right. um, and and the, the the proportion of tax of, of individual personal income tax that's paid by the, the top 10% in Australia used to be about 40, 35%. Now it's about 55%. Mm-hmm. So what's happening is you're getting a narrower and narrower group of people who are paying all the tax. Mm-hmm. Now that's kind of putting your eggs all in one basket. So it's a bit risky. And, and part of that is driven by, by this mobility issue, right? So who pays the corporate tax in Australia? It's the banks and the mining companies because mm-hmm. they can't go anywhere else. Yeah. Right. The medical technology companies, the IT companies, they don't pay any tax. Even if they're based in Australia, they just have enough operations mm-hmm. overseas that they can shift the, the tax elsewhere. Who pays the tax in Australia? It's the it's the it's the white collar, uh, upper class workers, uh, academics, public servants, people working for consulting firms, people working for banks. Um, it's it's not uh, anybody who is running a business. Or, or working in a way that they could fold into a business mm-hmm. is able to set up a trust, set up a corporate structure, and basically avoid paying any tax. So what you're seeing is it, it's not that what. So the reason the personal income tax base is narrowing is not because you're getting a phenomenon where 
there's all these like super rich that you're getting all the tax from. It's instead that there's all these people who used to be in the top 10% who've moved out. Mm. Yeah, right. And they've moved out into these other structures that allow them to organize their life to pay no tax. Hi, I'm Sam Walton, owner of the Walmart shopping chain and one of the richest men in America. As you know, there's a lot of talk in Washington about raising taxes on the so-called super rich. And as you can imagine, that idea doesn't sit too well with me. So here's my offer. If you write your congressman and tell him you oppose this tax plan, I'll pay you $100,000. <laughs> That's right, $100,000 in cash just for writing a letter to your congressman. All you do is make a photocopy, mail it to my Arkansas headquarters, and you get your money in five business days. <laughs> now, I know some of you are wondering how it could be in my interest to pay each of the 130 million American voters $100,000 apiece just to avoid a 3% tax hike. Well, you just let me worry about that. So, so this gets to kind of myth number three. You know, so, so myth number three is the best way to get more tax revenue is to raise the tax rate. And in fact, that's not the problem. The problem is there's a whole bunch of really wealthy people in Australia who are paying zero tax. Yeah. You can raise the rate to 60%. 60% times zero is zero. It's not mm -hmm. going to matter, right? All you're going to do is exacerbate this problem of putting a bigger big, and bigger burden on this narrower and narrower group of people and giving them more incentives to restructure their life so they can move out yeah. of that group and be in this group that doesn't pay any tax, right? So, so, so this is where... Um, you know, as we think about designing taxes going forward in this very complex world, we probably want to decomplexify our tax system. So we've, mm -hmm. we've put so much complexity into the system and people exploit that complexity to avoid paying tax. And so, and much of that complexity is kind of put in there, like we're trying to make the system more fair by singling out particular groups or individuals. Oh, we want to help small businesses. We want to help people mm -hmm. who do research and development investment. We want to help people in green energy. <clears throat> And, and, and we add in all this complexity and then people just exploit it to not pay tax. Yeah. And, and, and so one of the kind of real key principles of tax design is what you want to do is you want to have low tax rates, but that apply to every activity. Yeah. Um, and that way you avoid, well, you avoid two distortions, one distortion from having the tax rate be too high, the other distortion from being able to move from the special group that doesn't pay tax to the group that does pay tax. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so there you go. There's my lecture on uh, on, to, on uh, corporate tax and personal income tax, Mark. <laughs> yeah, that's good. We'll pick up some more uh, threads from there. I want to share two kind of hopefully funny anecdotes um, about how taxation has changed. So when I used to teach development economics, I did a comparison of um, where the U.S. Uh, got most of its tax revenue from at the uh, 1900, I think is, is the date. Um, versus the year 2000, but it might be 1810, but I think it's 1900. I can't quite remember. And uh, I always put it to the students. I'm like, what do you reckon is, is the main thing? And um, so the most important thing is tariffs. Yeah, I was good. Custom, custom duties would be yeah. huge 100 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so obviously we can't really do that anymore because as you said, there's these value chains where we've fragmented um, production and, and you want goods to cross borders multiple times where they're made in the country where the absolute specialized labor is for that sort of thing and you can keep costs down and instead of collecting tax revenue you instead have really cheap goods um, and that's kind of the trade-off there and as you said as well we don't have these like finished goods like a car arrives at the port and you like slap a tax on it um, things are much more sort of diffuse now another one that was um, not a big part of revenue but not insignificant was panama canal receipts was something like 3% yeah. okay. of the tax base. Yeah. And an absolutely massive one, I think it was like 40% of the US tax take in um, 1900 was postage stamps, <laughs> um, which is just not something that you think of anymore, right? Um, no, and now, then, we, now we give Rolex watches, so. Yeah, and then like goods and services taxes were there, but not in a general way. It was specifically sin taxes, mm. so taxes on, on alcohol and cigarettes. Um, which is still quite a big um, part of the tax take. But nowadays, yeah, it's mostly income tax, corporate tax, and um, goods and services taxes of some sort, and then capital gains tax. So I thought I'd, I'd move on then to talk about, uh, or to keep going on the themes that you'd, you'd already raised. So like one of the big stories at the moment in global taxes are how do we tax wealth? 
Um, so there's this, this push to have wealth taxes. Um, and, you know, a lot of that's driven by the things you mentioned, like people moving all their um, assets into art and storing it in a warehouse in Luxembourg and never looking at it. And that's really a terrible loss to humanity and things like that. So how do we tax wealth? Yeah, that's that's a, a hard one. Um, well, is so, wealth tax a good idea? Let's start with that. So, so, so I'm so there's two ways you can tax wealth, right? You can tax either the flow of savings, the flow of income from savings. You can you can tax the stock, or you can tax the flow. Mm -hmm. um, at least for Australia. Um, so if I could have the world the way I want it to be, mm -hmm. um, what I would have in Australia. It, uh, is I would have a very low, maybe seven or eight percent tax on all forms of savings. Mm -hmm. That would include owner-occupied housing. It would include dividends on shares. It would include capital gains on artwork. Everything seven percent I would tax. Very very cheap, right? Yeah. So, you know, you 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 bought a house for a million. You sell it for two million. You're going to have to pay seventy thousand uh, dollars of of that. 2 million sales price in, in capital gains tax under my system. That would actually be progressive compared to what we currently have because right. it would stop all the trust planning. So we have all this trust planning where people distribute money from a trust to people in their family who have low personal income tax yeah. rates and they don't distribute it to themselves. This would remove that. It wouldn't matter yeah. if I gave it to you or gave it to me, it'd be taxed at 7%. Wouldn't matter what our personal tax rates are. Um, that would, would do a, a much better job of taxing the flows from wealth than we currently do in mm -hmm. Australia. The second thing I think I would do is I would, and, and, and this is harder, and I, and I, is I would try to link that to a death duty or, or some kind of inheritance tax. So, so the, the problem we have in the world is that because, because the world has become so globalized, the reward for good ideas is much bigger than it used to be. So it used to be you had a good idea, you sold it to the 20 million people in your country. Now you have a good idea, you sell it to 8 billion people in the world. So we have this kind of superstar phenomenon where we have people building up these huge, huge fortunes. Um, and, you know, part of that is endeavor uh, and we don't want to punish it. Uh, part of it's luck. And we probably want to tax the luck benefit if we can. Uh -huh. And so having a, having a, a, a wealth tax, having a, an inheritance tax of, of some modest amount, you know, 10%, 7%, it could be set at my savings tax rate, I think would go a long way to, to help uh, address the, you know, the, you know, what we're worried about here is the intergenerational inequality. So I'm not worried so much about someone who has a great idea, works hard, makes a lot of money. I'm worried about passing it on to their children and whether that's really an efficient use of the money. And there's a lot of evidence that it's yeah. not. That, you know, call, we sometimes call it the Paris Hilton effect. The, mm -hmm. the heirs often don't use the money in, in kind of the productive ways that the people who, who made it did. So you should take a slice of that and, and say, all right, that's your, you know, we, we, we allowed you to amass this for, a fortune as a superstar. We're going to allow you to pass most of it on or, you know, and then also you incentivize people giving it away to charity before they die and that kind of mm -hmm. thing, which, you know, you don't want to tax those kind of gifts. You just want to tax the the unintended bequest at, at the end. Um, the, the problem with that idea is that most death duties in most countries don't raise much money and people find lots of ways around it. Um, mm -hmm. And particularly in countries like Australia where you have trusts, people would just move all their assets into a trust that would outlive yeah. them after they died and you wouldn't make much money. So, so, so there's a question of kind of what I think would be ideal and then what I think is actually feasible in the current system. Um, but, but I guess, so, so I, my take one is that I think we need to do a lot better job of taxing the flows from, from wealth than we currently do. We allow a lot of those things to go on tax. Um, and, and again, it, you know, if you had a very broad base and a very low rate, I think you'd, you'd make money and you would also make sure that nobody escaped the net. Mm -hmm. And this, you, you, you said something about how, you know, you don't want, you want, you don't want these high custom excises. You want to keep uh, tariffs low uh -huh. and allow goods to move back and forth. And then the benefit of that is you're not getting tax revenue, but you're getting these ch cheap goods. Right. And I, uh -huh. and, and, you know, my take on, you know, when people say let's tax Google, let's tax Facebook is that maybe those companies don't exist to produce tax revenue for Australia. Uh -huh. Maybe they exist to produce lots of really cheap goods for people. Yeah. And, you know, there's lots of different ways that things can bring well being. And if you think about, you know, I mean, Google, 10 years ago, everybody loved Google and now everybody hates Google, right? Um, 
And it's not clear why this radical change, because Google's doing the same thing it was 10 years ago. It's giving us all this stuff for free and it's making our life easy. And it's allowing us to do lots, lots more stuff than we were able to do before and get lots more information. And, you know, and, and, you know, by all means, people should be aware of what the trade-off is. What am I giving to Google in exchange for that? If you don't like that trade-off, then don't involve yourself in the bargain. But it's not clear to me why any of this is a, 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 something that should be taxed by government. Uh, in many ways, it's just a barter transaction. Google's giving me free search services. I'm giving them my data in exchange. If I mow my neighbor's lawn and my neighbor gives me some peaches, the government doesn't try to tax it. This isn't yeah. any different. It's just happening between a big company and me, right? Um, and so I'm not a huge fan. I, I, I'm not a huge fan of trying to tax these big tech companies simply because I, because because a, uh, you know, I'm happy to take the well-being that they generate without tax, and b, I'm relatively convinced that the tax, any tax that we would put on Google, is simply going to end up being passed on to Australian businesses in the form of higher prices for advertising. So, so it's very hard, given the nature of that market, given the cost structure of that market, it's. V it's very, very hard to tax Google in any meaningful way in Australia. Um, the only people who can tax Google are, is where it's located in the US, right? right. Um, and they give massive tax breaks to all those companies because they like the fact that they're located in the US and they like all the high income jobs they create. And they get the money instead through consumption tax and property tax from those workers who are living in California. So, And through investment, um, right? So that was, it's just a small point, I guess, but it, it always strikes me that like I... I I think Amazon's a pretty disgusting company, but it's also sort of undeniable that Amazon does reinvest colossal amounts of money. And as I understand it, Amazon is a thoroughly loss-making enterprise despite its huge revenues. Um, and part of the reason why it never pays tax is because it's always making losses because it's always reinvesting its profits into the economy. And, and you shouldn't, like, you know, maybe you think oh, it would be better if we got some of that money into the government so we could build, I don't know, broadband infrastructure or solar plants or whatever like i don't want to discredit that but like at the same time that money's slushing through the pipes as the keynesians would say um it's exactly. not it's and not sitting in jeff bezos's account right and maybe there are other ways maybe there are other veins you can stick a needle into to pull some of mm. that out rather than, than trying to stick it into them apple is similar right apple invests massive mm. amounts apple's never paid a dividend right they, they yeah. invest all the money back into new production right it's a very odd thing these people that own these expensive apple shares and Mm. I, I don't know what they think the terminal point is. Uh, you know, that yeah. Apple's never going to pay a dividend. So the terminal point is that some, at some point Apple sells the company to someone else and then you get your share bought out. Mm. That seems unlikely. Or Apple somehow gets surpassed like every other company gets surpassed in 20 years and Apple shares plunge down to zero and maybe mm. you just are going to sell out. You're going to time your selling right. So there you go. There's my, yeah. there's my share selling advice for your podcast. <laughs> don't buy Apple. Okay. <laughs> Quick question. Why are death taxes so unpopular? Well, economists love them, right? Because yeah, they have no, they have no dead weight loss. You can't you can't not die, right? There's there's no distortion. Yeah. If I tax you for working, you can stop working, but you can't not die. Um I I'm not quite sure. It may be something about adding insult to injury. Mm -hmm. Uh it may be, you know, it's probably unpopular with children. Um you one of the things in Australia that's been in the media a lot the past couple of months is the fact that people don't spend down their superannuation balances mm, and die yeah. with large super balances intact that they then pass on to their children. And talking to people in the super industry and in the aged care industry, um, they both said to me, oh, you'd be surprised at how much the children get the parents not to draw down the money or how the children get the parents to, to buy the cheapest possible aged care, even though these people are super wealthy and they have lots of yeah. money and, you know, the if you go into aged care, the average time you spend there is about 18 months, right? Right. And, and why, you know, and, and 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 you could spend, you know, at a kind of $200 a day level and have a really mm. nice aged care experience and, and not exhaust your money in two years. Yeah. Or you could spend at $50 a day and leave more money for the children to inherit. And, yeah. he, and you know, both in the aged care and the super industry, people said, oh, yeah, the kids are there like, oh, no, don't sign up for that expensive plan. Dad, that's really, that looks right. really bad, right? You sign up for this cheap one here, right? So... So, so clearly people, the children yeah. also may be against the death taxes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's interesting. Cause yeah, I mostly hear in the opposite way that um, people roughly my age who are trying to get into the property market are like, you know, I'm sick of you guys telling us that you're going to leave the property. I need you to like sell your property, live down the annuity. So there's more stock in the market, um, things like that. But it'd be different if you were at the, uh, the point where they're about to die, then your financial considerations are different. 
Yeah. And I guess people accumulate this money and they sort of say, oh, well, you know, I've, I've accumulated all this money and now it's up to me to do what I want with it. I want to, you know, I, yeah. I should get to decide who it goes to, not the government, which is particularly rich when it comes to superannuation, mm-hmm. because basically you've accumulated all this money with a massive tax discount given yeah. to you by the other million taxpayer, right? So, so I, I imagine this ad campaign that I want to run, mm-hmm. which is um, pictures of, of, of nurses and firemen um, and, 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 and the tagline is, these people are working and paying taxes so millionaires can pass their wealth on to their children without any tax, right? Mm-hmm. So I think there is a, I think you could in Australia run a fairness campaign about this issue that yeah. would change some people's minds, so. Yeah, we'll see. Okay, so that's good. Let's say uh, I've got two last questions um, that are still like relatively meaty questions if you have the time. So We've talked about maybe how we can tax wealth. How can we tax these multinational companies more effectively? Talked about that a little bit in terms of um, maybe just don't tax them. But I was wondering if you could comment a bit on like base shifting and this sort of stuff and whether this is something we should be worried about or how we can stop it. Yeah, I guess what we've seen is we haven't seen corporate tax rates for the most part crash down to zero. We've seen countries maintain corporate tax rates and we've seen, you know, the average tax rate, corporate tax rate in the OECD has come down maybe to about 20% or a little bit low. So I think, you know, I think that, so, so I think two things. One is I think that you're never going to get rid of this activity completely. Uh Um, You know, if for no other reason than that companies can afford to hire very smart lawyers and accountants, generally better ones than the government regulators, and they're going to find ways to exploit the rules to, to move money overseas and to avoid paying tax in countries. I think across the OECD, there's a lot more data sharing than there used to be, which I think helps. And I think, and, and you know, we've seen with the Panama Papers, we've seen with the, the various uh, scandals that, you know, people who've moved lots of assets overseas to places like the Cayman Islands have been exposed and they've paid a really high reputational price for that. So, so I actually think kind of public shaming is uh-huh. not a completely yeah. bad way to deal with some of these things. And that's easier if you have more information. So, so what's, you know, what's the kind of ideal world? The kind of ideal world is where, you know, every country in the world had a, a modest, you know, 15 to 20% corporate tax rate. And we all had roughly the same tax rate. And, and we all had roughly the same rules around um, uh, deductibility of debt, deductibility of equity. And, you know, that's, we're kind of closer to there than we used to be. Um, and the OECD base erosion profit shifting task force has actually improved things a lot. So, so I actually think in some ways we're doing okay on this. Um, okay. And, and, I, and I think you don't want to get too precious about trying to do it perfectly because I don't think you're ever going to do it. The only way you could do it is you've got every country in the world to get together and agree about a harmonized international tax system. And I, if, if there was something we could get every country in the world to get together and agree about, I think I'd pick global warming first before uh, I'd pick that. Right? Sure. So okay. g- given this is like a super low probability event, and I'm probably only going to get one crack at it. Let's do global warming and we'll do tax next. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, and again, I think in many ways, think about where, you know, think about other ways to tax, uh, to tax the, the income that's generated by by corporations, whether that's through land taxes, uh, taxing labor income, taxing consumption, you can tax the, the stuff that they generate in other ways. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, sweet. Well, um, you've got a busy day ahead of you campaigning for tax reform in Australia, so uh, we might wrap up there. Um, but thanks very much. Uh, do you have any if I could get if I, if I could get tax reform just at the university, I'd be happy. So, oh, yeah. um, so the universe, so here's, so in, in my most recent uh, TTPI newsletter, I start out with a parable and, and the parable goes roughly like this, is that there's a, you know, once upon a time, there was a very, very highly ranked university mm-hmm. that also housed the nation's leading think tank on tax policy. And the, th- and the university said, we're going to change the way we tax the external grants that people mm-hmm. bring in. And the tax policy institute said to the university you should use optimal tax theory which says that what you want to do is have a low tax rate a very wide base so every dollar that comes in you tax at a very low rate no exceptions um and you know and everyone and and that would be that that avoids limit that avoids corruption it avoids game playing um it minimizes distortions uh and it minimizes administrative burden the university then 
in this parable um, did change the way it taxed people. But instead, what it did is it brought in a tax with a very, very high rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It put, in, nice it put in a very large tax-free threshold. So it put in a threshold under which you don't pay any tax at all. Um, and it put in a mechanism where there's lots of opportunities to ask for special exemptions um, to avoid paying the high yeah. rate. Um, so it pretty much brought in every element of a tax system that you would not want. It, it pretty much did the opposite of exactly what you would want on every single thing. Um, what is the moral of this parable? The moral is that very, very smart people mm -hmm. can have really bad instincts when it comes to tax policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully this is an isolated case, uh, <laughs> but I'm not optimistic. All right. Well, thanks very much for joining us on a Podstimology poll, and uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon. It's been heaps of fun, Mark. Thanks.